Okay, so that's now recording. So look, welcome everyone to this, um, this session of the Tarza Thematic Week uh, conference. Um, so this is a, a session which is hosted by the thematic group on the sociology of work, labor and economy. Um, and I wanna start by acknowledging the traditional owners of countries throughout Australia and recognizing their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And today I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Darug people, um, lands which were never ceded. And attendees may also like to write the lands from which they are attending in the chat function if, if you so desire. So again, welcome. Um, we'll now begin. We have two papers uh, this afternoon. Um, the first paper is by Emeritus Professor David Rowe from Western Sydney University. And I'll be, uh, as well as chairing the meeting, I'll be presenting the, the second paper. Um, so David will start. Uh, David's paper is titled The Labour of Sport, Reflections on the Front and Backstage Workplace. And after David speaks, there'll be time for, for questions. And I think as we discussed um, at the beginning, I think we can keep this quite informal because of the um, because of the, the relatively low attendance. So David, over to you. Good, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm speaking from the land of the Gadigal people. Of course, I pay my respects to the elders uh, past, future, uh, present and future. Well, um, I'm I'm pleased to have the opportunity to um, to speak. I, I usually, when I when I write a chapter or um, something about to be published, I often like to kind of kind of give it a kind of preview, like a, a kind of premiere or something. And uh, this piece uh, or part of this, or what I'm talking about today, is coming out um, shortly in a a book edited by Stephen Wagg and Alison Pollock called "The Palgrave Handbook of Sport, Politics, and Harm." And in, uh, in that, I, I, I thought about uh, particularly the, uh, the case of uh, the late uh, cricketer Philip Hughes, um, who, as pe people may know, uh, was tragically killed whilst batting um, at, um, at the SCG, uh, Sydney Cricket Ground, and um, a, a few years ago. And it, um, Given that the theme of this strand was was essentially about work or labour, uh, I thought it was a, a good opportunity to think about this uh, this whole issue of sport as a workplace because um, the uh, the father of the late uh, Phil Hughes, Philip Hughes, um, uh, complained that his son um, had died because he was operating in a, uh, an unsafe workplace. And I wanted to think about, about sport, professional sport in particular, as a workplace. Uh, and I think that's something that we've been a little, um, so, some people at least, have been conflicted about the whole idea of, um, of seeing sport as work. And, Therefore, the places where sport is practiced uh, as a workplace. Now, in the title, I mention uh, both the front, following Goffman, the front front stage and the backstage, uh, essentially in sport. And we've seen a number of um, of scandals, in particular uh, related to the back to the backstage and area. And I think probably the most notorious case in recent years is in American gymnastics and um, the uh, ultimately the, um, the sentencing of, of for multiple lifetimes for se sexual abuse of, uh, of, of young gymnasts uh, of Larry Nasser and uh, one of the one of his victims who people may recall from the uh, the Tokyo uh, Olympics uh, was Simone Biles, and who, um, who you know, clearly was still suffering trauma from that backstage um, conduct. 
uh, uh, illegal and conduct by Larry Nasser, her, her trusted coach and the uh, doctor, sorry, and the, um, the, the, the um, covering up of it by American gymnastics and the authorities. Uh, most though of what I want to talk about today is the front stage component of the, of the if you like, the sports labor process. And, um, because as people may know, I'm, uh, I'm particularly, I'm a media sociologist uh, or I'm a cultural sociologist, but specifically I'm interested in media. And um, so I've written quite a lot about the ways in which the uh, two fields uh, in Bourdieu's and Bourdieu's in terms, one might say, uh, or just or more in more orthodox way in terms of the history of sociology, the institutions of sport and media have intersected uh, in uh, very important ways, interpenetrated, um, I would argue. And I think that has, uh, in the professional sports in particular, that has a big impact on what kind of labor, what kind of work is a person doing when they're a professional sports person? And uh, may I just, I'll just read a little bit of the kind of formal side of, the, um, of what I want to say, just to I kind of nail it down a little. Um, so, uh, so despite the sophisticated modern organization of play and display, uh, the symbolic underpinning of sport harks back to pre-industrial and pre-capitalist times, being influentially linked to the ancient Olympics in which physical competition was imagined as pure, that commas, athletic contestation and performance that was not only unremunerated, but could also instigate a temporary truce among warring parties, the so-called uh, Olympic truce. Although empirically flawed, flawed, there is evidence that ancient Olympians could be handsomely compensated. This notion of sport as a domain insulated from the daily struggle for existence was adapted out of ancient Olympic narratives and British organizational methods in the modern Olympic revival instigated by the French aristocrat Pierre de Coubertin, Baron Pierre de Coubertin. It was institutionally anchored in the school curriculum and materialized in adulthood in the masculinist social class-based distinction in referring to Bourdieu of those of independent means who could afford to engage in sport at a high level without the need to be paid to play. So it's the heavy infusion of the, am the amateur ethic in, in, in sport at the elite level. These elite amateurs were set apart from those in lower social classes for whom playing without material compensation or reward was a luxury that they could not afford. And cricket, for example, there's a distinction between gentlemen, gender term, and amateurs uh, who actually had separate dress dressing rooms and even went on and off the field down separate ste sets of steps in, in some places, so they were kind of kept apart as the, the gentlemen amateurs so, and, and the professionals, i.e. a clear class distinction. This structurally conditioned difference in orientations to sport um, was exacerbated at the, as the industry create, created, uh, the industry was created by enclosing sport events and became more extensive and sophisticated charging spectators for entry and servicing their needs to eat, drink, and so on. So, and, um, and, and one of the key, key developments here was, um, was that sport was taken beyond place by, by the media. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the two institutions or fields interpenetrated. Sport was the, was the key con constituent of what I call the media sports cultural complex, connecting diverse practices, products, and services around playing and watching it. The pivotal maker space where sport could be expertly practiced under the gaze of co-present and media dependent spectators is the stadium. In spatial terms, the stadium came to be regarded in religious discourse as hallowed ground. 
However, these cathedrals of sport, as they're often called also, could not be regarded readily as workplaces any more than in the Christian tradition that nurtured sport culture in the West. Churches were seen as the places where professional worker priests were subsidized by congregations of consumers by means of the collection plate. So this point, uh, I'm exaggerating for heuristic purposes, uh, is, um, is being emphasized because it illuminates the conflict, perhaps contradiction, that situates sport simultaneously as in some ways transcending the material world while signifying the many ways in which it cannot escape it. Between the almost mystical vision of transcendent sport and the mundane reality of capital accumulation and the exchange of labor power, in the leisure market is a range of justifications for sports existence and nature. Now, I won't go on any more about that, but I think you uh, perhaps get the sense of, um, of what I mean there, that I think that there is a res residual, you know, uh, in Raymond Williams's terms, one could regard these as sort of residual elements of culture, uh, residual, resi residual uh, side of sport or strand of sport, uh, which is uh, amateurist in, in its value system, while being hyper-professionalized um, at its uh, elite commercial level. Um, the, uh, the inquest into the, into the death of Philip Hughes, uh, I, I, I read the transcripts of, um, by the magistrate, uh, uh, magistrate Barnes, Michael Barnes, I think it's called, and um, uh, and it was. I mean, a number of organisations were were um, were re registered were present at the con at the uh, uh, during um, this legal proceeding, in including um, Safe Work New South Wales. And there was an argument as to uh, at the inquest as to whether uh, um, the, or to some degree, um, was the cricket pitch a workplace? And if so, um, was it unsafe, or were there particular um, aspects of qualities of this, this sports workplace, like many others? Um, that distinguished it uh, from other workplaces, but uh, where certain forms of conduct were not only acceptable, but expected. So there was a long discussion, for example, of sledging, the, uh, the activity, sometimes humorous, sometimes vicious, sometimes defamatory, racist, sexist, whatever other ist you want to introduce. Um, well, there's this practice common in sport, in that sport, um, was acceptable work, workplace conduct, whether the umpires, um, as those who were vested with responsibility for safety and the maintenance of rules in that place, um, had discharged their duties effectively and so on. Um, in the case of Philip Hughes, Magistrate Barnes determined that he had suffered accidental death and that there was no direct evidence uh, of, um, you know, of neglect of duty um, by any particular party. So it was, uh, it was recorded as a, a, an accidental or tragic death. But there's an ethical component. Uh, um, he says, look, there's no, there's no actual evidence that, for example, an, a, another fast bowler, not the one who struck Hughes, said that he was going to, go, going to kill him, which apparently, um, you know, is, is treated as a, uh, a kind of, you know, unremarkable thing for a fast bowler to say to a batter. Uh, the magistrate came in with, a, with an, an ethical um, uh, ruling or, or a statement rather than ruling. An, outsi an outsider, he said, is left to wonder why such a beautiful game would need such an ugly underside. So there was a lot of debate around that time as to uh, whether the, um, the, you know, cricket was on trial here and whether uh, unfair things were being said about 
uh, sport as a workplace, this particular sport as a workplace. And I don't want only to talk about Philip Hughes because in the abstract, I did mention a whole range of other areas where I think quite, uh, analogous issues are, are raised as to whether uh, there is something special about sport as a workplace and whether uh, it, uh, that is acceptable, whether many of us as spectators uh, in, in, in the actual place watching sport or as most of us are in mediated sport, um, you know, watching it largely on television, whether we are, are complicit or implicated in some way, do we, do we encourage sport as an unsafe workplace, both physically and mentally? And I, just, I mentioned a number of cases, I've already talked about the whole area of sexual abuse, uh, this is something uh, which has also come out, I mean, uh, in, in association football called soccer here in Australia, um, in Britain. Um, and um, the, the current case, uh, high profile case of Peng Shui, the, 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 Shui, the, the tennis, Chinese tennis player, um, and questions as to whether she ha ha has been sexually abused and indeed whether um, by by telling the world about it, she has been placed uh, uh, under duress, uh, in house arrest, uh, whatever, uh, you know, privation that she's been put through because essentially as a victim, she's been victimized again, or alleged victim. Uh, racism, I mean, we don't I mean, we go through so, so many cases, the Adam, the Adam Goods example in Australian rules football, in quite clearly, but a, a, um, a, you know, very dramatic example during the Euros, the Euro for Euros 2020-21, uh, again in association football where, uh, where black players who missed penalties for England were subjected to the most vicious um, racial abuse on um, social media. Um, the case of, of mental health has become um, very much to the fore. And I found the case of Naomi Osaka, for example, the world's leading, was the world's leading women's tennis player, certainly the world's richest one, if not number one, in, uh, in playing terms. Uh, and her reluctance to give post-match uh, press media conferences uh, on the grounds that it was it was bad for her mental health, that she was an introverted person, and this was an unreasonable workplace requirement. And I thought that was a particularly um, important and instructive case because um, there were various people who, who essentially said media performances of that kind are part of the job. You know, it's why it's why you get the big bucks because you have to deal with the media. Others saying, well, she's essentially there for her, her tennis prowess. We don't ask her to be you know, a great interviewee. It's un unreasonable to expect someone who's just suffered you know, a terrible disappointment. You know, in particular, they've lost a match. And then you know, someone does the, the, the kind of equivalent of sticking a microphone under their nose and say, how do you feel? And um, so I, you know, the, I think that, that raises the question, as I mentioned, about the because of the interplay between media and sport, about whether the routines associated with media as a workplace um, uh, seamlessly, seamlessly interweave with what we might expect as reasonable of a sports person, elite sports person who was there essentially because of, of, the, of excelling in performance rather than um, in rhetoric or conversation. Um, there is a lot of discussion, of course, at the moment about traumatic brain uh, injury and uh, multi-billion dollar cases, for example, in gridiron or American football and in other sports, uh, rugby league, rugby union, um, 
come, uh, coming through uh, the whole the whole issue of whether the in the backstage the kind of you know repetitive um, activities that someone has has to be, physical activities one has to engage in sport which I imagine cannot be good for the body let alone body contact stuff and other um, other activities you know backstage um, you know what is it legitimate to ask for in the name of sport um, back, both you know backstage for our delectation and delight from front stage as, as spectators sometimes handsomely rewarded um, but there's also of course a whole other area of semi-professional and amateur sport um, strata which still exist in which many of the protections which apply uh, you know, such as defibrillators and, you know and uh, and ambulances on hand and that immediately on hand um, and helmets in cricket and you know protective gear whether those are all um, e equally available you know to people who are essentially playing largely for fun rather than as a job which brings us back to the whole question of work and finally sexism and uh, you know noted in particular Kayla Kayla Harris uh, you know the, the uh, Australian Bulls football, footballer and a, a famous picture of her uh, which was sexualized it's not even memorialized as a statue but uh, uh, the particular kind of sexist abuse that she received um, after that photo was taken and um, and her her response uh, angry response was you know this is my workplace why are you treating me in this way I'm I'm, I'm a footballer why are you sexualizing um, my conduct why are you turning an ex extraordinarily athletic beautiful athletic photograph, action pho photograph in, in, into some, some form of pornography. So I think um, those, those are just, you know, obviously a, a wide ranging, my wide ranging concerns, there are, there are many others. And I'm not saying that, that, that these are issues that aren't found in other workplaces, but I do think that there is something um, particular about the front stage element of sport that there are few occupations you know where the maker space activity goes on sometimes for a global audience and um, and the uh, is heavily media dependent and therefore subjected to um, to rules and pressures from another field because it is the major paymaster of the sport field and so it makes certain demands on the workers uh, in that field. And, not, and athletes aren't the only, uh, only workers but they're, uh, in that field, but they're the ones that I'm concentrating on today. So, um, so thanks for the opportunity to, to air some of these ideas. I'd be very interested to have uh, a you know, conversation either today or at other times on what people feel about, about sport as a safe or unwork uh, or unsafe uh, workspace. Thank you. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, okay. So, uh, look, I, I um, we do have a little bit of time now for for comments or particularly questions to David. Would anyone like to? I think we there are only five of us, so that, again, we can keep this fairly informal. So you can raise your hand in Zoom, or you can just um, um, speak up if, if you wish. Would anyone like to, to ask a question, Roger? Yes, yes, thanks. Um, thanks, David. I like the idea of using the front stage and the backstage because in, in most cases, it's pretty clear that certainly high performance sport is a workplace. And more, more than that, it's a sport, it's a workplace where it is videoed to within an inch of, inch of its life. And just take that, Taylor Harris kick, the photographer had to kind of explain why he chose that particular photograph because you know there was about um, you know there were about eight or ten of them. Those photo uh, those cameras can take about ten or twelve frames a second, and it was clearly um, you know it was if it was a, a male footballer, and we see you know it, 
it was definitely, you know, it was just the same as many men would do. But in this case, a lot of people got on social media and, and as you said, sexualized it or pornified it, if you like. Um, so, and I think that that, yeah, that backstage, front stage gives you the, the space to see it both as, as a workplace, but also as something else above, because, it, you know, in, in our culture, you know, we take uh, Farida's points before, I mean, Australian values are really no different from any other values. Um, but sport, especially in a, it, sport in Australia, is, it has a, a significance probably greater than it should do. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, yeah, uh, Roger. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, there's a huge liter literature on sexualization of women in sport, and I, I mean, I've only just very briefly touched on it, and it extends from, um, you know, the kinds of arguments that are going on in Scandinavia of all places at the moment about what is appropriate um, uh, sports clothing for women handballers um, uh, um, on. Um, on one side, and I mean, it's not that long ago. I mean, it's a couple of decades, but it's not that long in you know in, in, in real time since I was getting phone calls from Japanese newspapers asking me why the Matildas, um, you know, are, are one of what what is now one of the top so-called sport sport brands in Australia, why the Matildas uh, football team soccer team, uh, why were they um, involved in nude calendars? Yeah. And they they were, I mean, the Japanese were just, you know, these journalists were just kind of, they were astonished, you know, what, what these are, why are these elite sportswomen um, turning up in calendars and either, well, you know, not either naked or, or, or without wearing very much? And and I had you know kind of explained to them that the, you know this was because they didn't have the resources at that time to actually be uh, uh, the the kind of football team that they wanted to be, even though they're representing the nation, and so they're raising money in that you know one would have to say degrading way. So that I mean, so I think that that whole area um, that that we've discussed art articulates with the um, the whole way in which you know gender and, and um, has a bearing on sport as a workplace it's you know and it goes through all kinds of areas including uh, of of course um, parity of pay and reward and there are changes starting to happen uh, you know, if we're talking about work and gender here in the sports workplace, where, for example, the base payment in um, to players in cricket, I think, and in in association football now in Australia, the base payment for men and women is the, is the same or close or very close. Of course, the ultimate rewards that they get are still vastly different. Um, but I do think we, you know, we have to keep keep thinking, yeah, um, about about the the whole the whole problem again going front stage back backstage that in many ways in order to convert the labor going on backstage uh, for athlete athlete women into front into um, reward like legitimate reward or parity with their male counterparts has it has often involved sexualization in the front stage and mm -hmm. that is a uh, is a pri a very heavy price to have to Okay. Um, Eduardo? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, just wanted, uh, and apologies, I was making lunch at the beginning, so in case I, I misheard you, but this notion of the front and backstage mm -hmm. obviously suggests uh, Goffman mm -hmm. uh, as one possible source, the presentation of the self. Uh, but you also seem to be adding uh, a dimension that has to do with uh, hidden or implicit labors that make the the the, the front stage uh, aspects of sport kind of possible. So 
I just wanted to draw you out a little bit uh, on that because the I guess my and I haven't read presentation myself for a long time, but my my memory of it is that you know the the depiction of the restaurant workers who you know in the front stage of where they're serving uh, the customers they have to work in a certain way and uh, you know in the kitchen uh, or having a, a ciggy outside they yeah. they have all these different kinds of uh, uh, conduct uh, rules uh, and so forth, but I, I suspect that you are adding, yeah, another dimension to do with the hidden and that. So I just want to draw you out on that a little bit more. Thanks. Yes, thanks, Edward. It's a good, good question. And uh, yeah, I, I, I know I'm taking a bit of liberties with Goffman there. Uh, in fact, really, I was probably thinking of Dean McCannell's The Tourist, um, you know, who also used the concept of oh. front stage and backstage. Uh, Aussie in, in drawing on, on Goffman. I suppose um, the, the reason that I find it a, a kind of useful metaphor um, is specifically because of the of the involvement of the media. So, so you know, a, a great deal of the labour in sport goes on um, outside of the, uh, uh, the the view of the media, but. Um, professional sport, elite professional sport, it uh, requires the practice of sport in, in real time uh, and uh, available um, sometimes to, to, to global audiences. So I suppose what I was just trying to, trying to say there was that there is a, a whole lot of labor that goes on behind the scenes and there are, there are work related issues there uh -huh. to do with um, sexual assault, or, or uh, racism. I mean, we're seeing a case in uh, English cricket at the moment in Yorkshire, um, where um, a, uh, a, a an English player with a, a background in, uh, from Pakistan was you know, has been subjected to all kinds of uh, humiliation. So there's kind of the backstage um, uh, issues there about protecting you know, proper rights at work. And then I think um, in sport, there is the, the, the hyper front stage where one is expected uh, in a uh, sense, bear all, you know, bear everything. You know, as I mentioned the Neo, Naomi Osaka case, you know, where, um, you know, I mean, I don't know how many, how, how many of us um, would, be, would be equipped um, to be able to handle the pressures, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, missing a penalty, a double fault in a grand slam, you know, all that, uh, uh -huh. all that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm playing a bit fast and loose with it, but I just thought it was a useful way of drawing out two rather different issues around around labour and and our and our you know the rights of the people involved as well as the rights of the kind of paying customer who wants to see it all. That's true. Thanks. Um, I did have a question, um, David. Uh, what's the, I mean, you talked a lot about the extent to which we can regard sports, particularly these elite sports or professional sports as workplaces in kind of ethical terms. But I'm wondering just what does the law itself say about this? Um, so in, in terms of, I mean, there was this magistrate's case, uh, or there was, a, there was a, an inquiry into Philip Hughes' death, mm. um, where it was, this, this issue was clearly touched upon as you talked about. But, then, but what does the law, I mean, if the law, to the extent that the law says something about it, you would think that in Australia, for example, there would have been fair work cases around this kind of thing. So I mean, is that I mean, what is there anything from legal cases which kind of sheds lights upon the which sheds light upon the primarily ethical questions that you're that you seem to be raising? Yeah, thanks. And again, yeah, good question. There, I mean, there there, there are a lot of um, legal implications uh, in in and around sport, and of course there is that whole um, the whole question of who who exercises authority within sport um, so is it you know the sport organization the you know international olympic committee at the super or fifa at the super level uh, the um you know the um australian olympic committee or 
Football Australia or whatever at the uh, the national level, and then there are regional bodies like UEFA and Asian Football Confederation, say in football. They're all so the, the, there's been some past the parcel around who exercises you know legitimate responsibility for um, rules of conduct and their enforcement. I think it's fair to say, um, and this is a very broad thing, broad statement, but there has been reluctance by the authorities, in particular the police, to get involved in, in sport. Um, historically, that has been the case. Now, many of the things that happen on the sports field inside the rules, but especially outside the rules, in contact sports, if conducted as, you know, this is a banal point, if conducted almost anywhere else, uh, would, would be a criminal act, a criminal act of violence, let's say, um, or a criminal act of, um, of, of racial vilification or you know, some other form of vilification captured within the Human Rights Act. Now, for many, for many, I would say, years, I'd say for most of the existence of the institution of sport, which is a, a product of modernity, and so probably what we recognize today as the institution of sport is, you know, comes from about the mid to late 19th century. For most of those of that period, there has been a great deal, great reluctance for the authorities um, to be involved in a whole series of areas ranging from corruption to violence. Um, I think that has changed bit by bit, and there has been pressure for the authorities, uh, in particular the police, in the first instance, and then the judiciary, to uh, to to reduce the claim to exceptionalism that one, one is typically historically seen in sport, which is like we can handle it ourselves, it's kind of okay. So when you've got, when you've got um, the FBI uh, going into the hotel where the FIFA executive um, is, is, is meet, staying in meeting in, uh, in Zurich and arresting people, uh, where you have at the moment people like Seth Blatter, you know, the former president, and Michel Platini, the uh, UA, former UEFA president, those people are, uh, you know, are, are up on charges and so on. And we have started to see cases, not just of players, um, but of fans being prosecuted for vilification, usually um, racial vilification or for threats of violence. So the law has been historically reluctant to get very involved in sport. That is changing. That hasn't come from within sport. It's come from outside people, you know, essentially arguing this is not a magical space that, you know, that transcends everything else, although it claims to be so. And actually inside sport, it's not come largely from the authorities, it's come from the practitioners, from the athletes themselves. And so athlete activism has been driving, you know, has motivating a lot of the uh, changes towards equity and, uh, uh, and um, proper treatment of everyone within that sporting institution. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. Um, are there any final quick comment, uh, quick questions before we move on? Okay. Well, thank you, David. That was great. That was um, that was a great presentation. And so, what we might do is, I'm uh, now speaking, so I'm going to share my screen with you. I do have a, couple, a few slides, um, and uh, perhaps um, David, if you want, as the other as the other speaker here, if I go beyond fifteen minutes or so, if you want to let me know in the chat, that might be really helpful. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll try not to control you. I, my, my handling of the technology is not that great anyway, but I do know how to use the chat function. So. No worries. Thank you. Uh, now, let's see. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. Great. Okay, so this is, the, this is my, um, 
uh, my presentation today from labour displacement to labour augmentation, building a model for the future of work and warehousing. Um, and that's my contact details just there. So the, the, in terms of theoretical background, um, this paper deals with this well-versed um, conundrum about the connection between automated technologies um, and work and, and employment. And the, one of the questions here is um, whether automation will lead to labour's displacement, so the destruction of jobs. Um, and another position is that, at least on aggregate, um, automation will not lead to the overall destruction of jobs. It may destroy some, but on aggregate, it will create more jobs than it than it destroys. Um, there's another view which sees that automation will lead to a process of disruption, so both displace, uh, processes of displacement and creation. And also a view that, uh, a similar view to that, which is that automation will lead to labour's augmentation by, by technology. And in, in warehousing, which is a, a high growth industry whose uh, kind of pr economic profile, if you like, has been enhanced during the, the COVID pandemic um, significantly because of the, the, the rise of e um, the continuing rise of e-commerce and online shopping. For warehousing, there's evidence that these trends are contemporaneous and, and parallel and not necessarily mutually exclusive. And this, this paper focuses this question on warehouses that supply Australian retail supermarkets. Um, and it's really, uh, it's an initial paper, it's a work in progress, it, it's an very much an empirical paper. Um, and uh, to just to kind of preempt any criticism, I suppose, it's, it's really lacking um, much of a conceptual framework. So I'm saying here it's an empirical paper in search of a, of a conceptual framework. So any advice or thoughts in that regard would be, would be most welcome. I mean, Conceptually, I, I have originally uh, sort of initially approached this through the lens of workplace regimes, which of course um, comes from Burroy's kind of seminal work. Um, but, uh, you know, um, but very much I'm interested in the relationship between the idea of labour regimes and workplace regimes and the interaction of, of, of bodies and technologies in the workplace. So I think there are various ways conceptually to approach this, but I still haven't. Uh, Quite worked it out. So very much an empirical paper, and I hope hope it's not too dry. Um, so as I said, this is initial research. It's initial research for a project about plans by Australia's largest supermarket brands to shift from old uh, kind of manual-based warehouses to new automated and roboticized warehouses by the mid 2020s. Um, as stated, as initial empirical paper. Um, involving some ongoing research about the relocation of a major supermarket um, uh, in Melbourne to a new model automated site and the impact that this has had on workers. The focus is on this paper is on Woolworths, uh, which everyone here will know, um, Australia's largest retail supermarket chain, around a thousand supermarkets nationally across Australia, currently Australia's second largest private employer. Um, has around a 40% share in retail groceries and operates a supermarkets which are supplied by warehouses, which are known generally as DC distribution centres, which are based in urban centres across the country. This paper is based on interviews with um, 27 manual workers across these two sites, an old site earmarked for closure and a new site, six so uh, shop floor supervisors, um, a senior manager and as well as trade union organisers um, from uh, the United Workers Union. And as I mentioned before, the research um, was based in Melbourne. The stuff I'm doing now is based in, up in Sydney, where I am based, but this, this paper is based on previous research in Melbourne. And this is a case study which is using a, a temporal comparative approach. So comparing an old site in one place to a new site in another place. So the old site, um, was known as the Melbourne Regional Distribution Centre, or um, more generally known as the Hume DC. Um, it was based in, in the northern Melbourne suburb of Broadmeadows, um, which as many of you will know, a multicultural working class area with relatively high unemployment and relatively high socioeconomic disadvantage. This site was gradually wound down by Woolworths between 2015 and 2019 at the cost of around 700 local jobs. And I've done some research on this, which is available in a report um, on the United Workers Union website, which you can 
access there or if, you, if you're interested you can email me and i'll be happy to to make that available to you there's also um some of you may have seen on social media this week a uh, new book um edited by uh, stephen fred golden um jessica gerard class in australia and uh, there's a chapter about this in that book um co-authored with jasmine ali and there's also a, a, an article of, um, on similar research, which is about to come out in a sociological review. So um, hopefully any moment now is supposed to be appearing online first. So there's a bit of background research here. Um, so that's the old site. And then the new site is, uh, is known as the MSRDC, the Melbourne South Regional DC in Dandenong South. So Southeast Melbourne, um, also a multicultural working class area. Um, this site was opened in 2018 and is regarded in the industry as a cutting edge automated site and very much seen by not just by Woolworths but by Coles and other companies as a model for the industry, for, for warehousing in the industry. So what, is a, what was the rationale for relocate, relocating the site? Why, why relocate the site? And the answer to this question really depends on who you ask. So if you ask management, uh, they will say that an automated site was needed for, for higher capacity. So to, to process more unique product lines or what are called in industry parlance SKUs or stock keeping units. Um, they argued that a new site, an automated site was needed to reduce unpacking time at retail stores. So enabling a greater diversity of unique product lines to be um, transported to, to stores more quickly. They argued that automation would reduce uh, workplace injury. And they argued that automation would improve workplace culture. And then if you ask workers and unionists, um, they, they don't tend to challenge the technical case around the technology. I mean, for example, who would, you know, who could argue that the idea of automation in order to reduce workplace injury was a bad idea, for instance. So they don't tend to challenge that, that, that technical argument, but they do, in this case at least, question the relocation from Northern to Southeastern Melbourne they do suggest that the relocation was more about industrial relations. It was more of an anti-union measure than a, um, um, a technology-based measure. And if you look at this, um, I don't know if you can see it very well, this, this slide here, um, it was uh, a highly unionized site with Union DC, um, over 80% union um, density, which is very high um, at, the, at, at this particular site. And you can see on the map there, uh, so it was based up in the up in the northern suburbs in in Broadmeadows, MSRDC down in Dandenong. I mean, if you that that commuting time is pretty substantial. Um, I mean, that is about a seventy three kilometre trip um, at forty five miles, seventy three kilometres. You know, even without traffic, that's going to take you what an hour and a half going down the Monash Freeway in the car. Um, if you get stuck in traffic, you're talking about a two to three hour journey one way. So it's a lot, it's quite, in terms of commuting time for workers and the potential for workers to transfer to the new site, it's, it's, it's very far away. So what I do in this paper and what I do in this slide here is just to take some point, key points of comparison between the two sites. So in the left column here, you've got the old site, the Hume DC, and in the right-hand column, you've got the, um, uh, the new site, the MSRDC. So in comparing um, these two sites, in terms of the role of the two sites, so first of all, what was the role of the Hume DC? Well, its role was to supply um, supermarkets across metropolitan Melbourne, and it, it, it had um, core functions of receiving, sorting, storing, picking, packing and dispatching goods to stores. Um, my research focuses on what happened within the four walls of the warehouse, so the sorting, the storing, the picking and the packing as opposed to those external points of the, of the logistical supply chain. And the role of the MSRDC is the same. It's effectively replacing the Hume DC as, Mel as Woolworth's most important warehouse in Melbourne. Um, in terms of the product capacity, the old site had um, capacity for 6,500 um, product lines approximately. The new site is more than or nearly um, double that in terms of its capacity. Um, in terms of the different sections between the two sites, in the Hume DC, you really had two main sections where workers were deploying. One was what was known as manual sorting. So this was a conveyor belt or a sorter where um, goods were uh, moved along the conveyor belt on pallets ready for transport to aisles via forklift. 
and then you had a manual pick pack section, uh, pick pack section, which in, in which workers would drive a pallet transporter up and down aisles. They would receive machine-based instructions, so AI-based instructions via a Bluetooth headset. Um, and this was the most um, physically demanding element of work in the warehouse. So very high rates of workplace injury, you know, a lot of twisting, a lot of reaching, a lot of bending, a, a lot of kind of physical contortions that led to, to physical injuries. In the, the new site, the MSRDC, we have um, a greater variety of different sections. So we have a, a semi-automated sorting section in which boxes are received and assessed. And at this assessment stage, the, the boxes which come in from suppliers are, are they, the company has to decide whether they are suitable for automation or whether they're suitable for, for manual picking. And this and those products which are, suit, which are deemed suitable for, for, for robots are taken by a, um, a machine called Adapto. This is uh, manufactured by a Dutch robotics company called Van der Lander. Um, and it's what's known as an, an ASRS, Automated Storage and Receiving System. It's, it's kind of like a shuttle. Um, and, it's, and the shuttle takes the goods to the automated section to be picked and packed by robots. And then you have a semi-automated um, picking section, a bit like the old warehouse where workers drive up and down, up and down, um, uh, up and down aisles with a transporter, except rather than physically picking boxes themselves, the, the adapto, the um, shuttle will, will, will retrieve those goods for them. And then you have an automated uh, packing system known as store pick, um, which is programmed with um, an uh, uh, AI-based technology known as load forming logic. And the analogy I would make here is, is to the old game of Tetris. So effectively the robots play Tetris. So they take a pallet, they, they have these robotic arms and they pick up the goods and they stack them on the pallet from bottom to top based on the most efficient and, and, and safest way of, of stacking the pallet. And those pallets are then taken by automated guided vehicles um, to dispatch, to trucks for dispatch. And then finally, you have a manual pick pack section, which is identical to the old pick a packer section in the Hume DC. In terms of jobs, the old Hume DC had about 700 workers, 700 team members. The new site has between 120 and 450 workers, and quite a large variation there in workers. And I'll come back in a moment and explain why there's such variation, but certainly fewer workers. Um, in terms of the demographics, um, so the Hume DC was mainly a male workforce, 84% male, although a high, um, high number of people from a non-English speaking background. So over 50% of the workforce born overseas, especially in um, countries from the Middle East and non-English speaking countries in Europe. Um, the new site, the MSRDC is, is more female. So it's a, nearly a third of the workforce is female, although Again, most of the workforce is still um, from a non-English speaking background, particularly from hailing from South and Central Asian countries. In terms of occupational groups, the vast majority of workers at the Hume DC were what are known as uh, colloquially as picker packers, so store persons or uh, manual laborers. In the, um, in the new sites, uh, that, that proportion is reduced. Um, Sorry if, if there's any background noise, you might be able to hear one of my kids yelling outside, outside my office door, but that's okay. Um, and then you also had a number of, uh, a number of workers who were hired as uh, team leaders um, on separate uh, salaried contracts. And then a, a portion of the workforce, 16%, who were not employed directly by Woolworths, but employed as specialists and technicians and engineers by the robotics company, by Van der Lande. Um, in terms of employment contracts, you had a core of permanent workers in the old sites surrounded by this periphery of casual workers and agency temps, which is a very kind of common, almost classic triadic model of employment relations in, um, in, uh, uh, in warehousing logistics. In the new site, you also have a, div a division here, um, although it's somewhat different, there's, 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 there's still a high proportion of agency temps. But the work, the permanent workforce has been split between those on union collective agreement and those who are brought on uh, salaried individual contracts. The union density I mentioned before, the old site uh, is, had over 80% union coverage. The new site um, is still a, it's still a union site. It still has over half the workforce in the union, but it is lower and um, management is less cooperative with the union than it was in the old sites. 
And in terms of wages, there's a, quite a significant drop in the basic hourly wage, hourly wage for picker packers. Um, so $34 in the previous DC down to $28 in the new site. So it's a lower wage um, site. So in terms of, back to my questions about uh, whether automation has primarily displacement effects or um, job creating effects or job, job augmenting effects, it certainly had a displacement effect in this case to some extent. Um, we had 700 jobs lost at the Green DC. Um, a, a, a large proportion of those workers were still unemployed um, six months later, although this was in the context of uh, the second wave um, pandemic in, in Victoria. Um, you had a large number of workers who went on to lose another job, having been re-employed after losing their first job, they then lost their, another job due to the COVID crisis. Most workers were finding jobs in, in warehouse in, in new warehouses. Um, only 11% of permanent uh, of workers had um, permanent contracts in their new jobs. For those who found found new jobs, a much higher proportion remained agency temps in new jobs. And almost all workers experienced a big fall in wages. So across the board, a 59% drop in wages. This data, by the way, is based on survey data. So I didn't mention this before, but um, we surveyed um, about 160 workers um, both prior, just prior to the closure of the site in 2019 and then six months later after it was closed. So, you know, high levels of, of workplace and financial precarity, and this is detailed in the, in the union report, which I mentioned before. However, there were some job creation effects here. So we know that jobs were created at the new sites, starting with 120 in 2017 and rising to over 450 more recently. There's been a, a focus on the company on uh, recruiting a, a different demographic of warehouse worker. Um, there were supposed to be some positions reserved for ex DC workers, but in practice, very few opportunities for these workers to transfer across. Only 15 workers from the Hume DC in total, or less than 3% of the Hume DC's old workforce were redeployed to new Woolworths DC's, and only three individuals were transferred across to the MSR DC. Um, so this is a quote from one of the union officials. If you had Hume on your resume, uh, it was a big fat no. You can't enter the site, we don't want you. So um, there was a seemingly a conscious attempt by the company to prevent workers from transferring across. And as I mentioned before, a big drop in wage rates. Um, and, and finally, um, in terms of augmentation effects, um, so to some extent, uh, manual picking at the previous site was already um, augmented by technology. So you had um, transporters, you had um, shorts, uh, sorters, chutes, and conveyor belts. You had um, AI-based technology in terms of workers' headsets in which algorithmically generated instructions were relayed to workers about where to travel in, on the warehouse floor and what to pick and what to stack. So all of these technologies, which were really developed in the early 2010s, were transferred across to the MSRDC. Um, except that now at the MSRDC, you have this fully automated robotic section. Nevertheless, you, you know, the, the notion of human, human supervision of robots is still required at every stage of automation. And this is a quote from one of the workers at the MSRDC who I interviewed. The MSRDC was meant to be a highly automated shed, uh, state of the art, with, um, but in the last 12 months, they've expanded the manual pick area. Um, instead of having no manual pick, it's been getting constantly bigger and bigger. This is mainly because of the COVID situation. Manage, if you ask management, they say, yes, they need, they've needed a greater volume of workers because of the COVID situation and because of greater demand for um, warehouse supply. But if you ask workers in the union, they say, not, not really. Um, so here's another quote from a worker that they were hiring lots more agency casuals and, and bringing them on as permanents. Um, sorry, I'm struggling to read this because my, my uh, uh, video's in the way at this moment. This was because of the system failure. There was a lot of glitches. Things weren't moving as efficiently as they'd hoped. They needed more bodies on site in case the robots went down. So essentially, this, I guess the question I'm concluding with here is that there's a, there's a story here, I think, about the limits of technology. Um, there's a story here about the extent to which things have, have really changed, um, that we have a shift towards this new supposed model for the industry, a model of automation, and yet um, the, the company's requirements for, um, for, for human beings, 
the, the manual labour has increased over time and workers themselves seem to be pointing to the problems with robotic and automated technology in terms of the need to, to supplement the machines at the site. So that's, that, that's my paper. Um, as I said, very much an empirical paper um, without a, a, a strong conceptual framework yet or without a strong conclusion. But absolutely, I would welcome your, your thoughts in, in helping me to, to develop this, um, this initial research. So thank you very much. Um, I guess now I should ask if there are any uh, questions or comments. <laughs> you, uh, do you want me to, to, uh, to run this from, from now? Uh, that would just, be great, David. Yes, yeah. thank you. Well, I mean, just to... Uh, so the, are, there, are there any questions from, the, from those present? Um, I mean, I've, oh, sorry, I can't, I, I'm trying to spot you. Oh, no. David, I think Quentin had his hand up as well. Did he? And um, Eduardo. And then after that, I'll, I'll ask you. I don't have, I can't see any hands up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay go great. ahead, Quentin. Yeah, that's uh, good. Thanks, Tom, for the presentation. That was really interesting. I was actually just clapping. Uh, uh -huh. to, uh, to oh. hear, but, but I do have a quick question. Um, I, do, I don't know if you've um, been able to check that um, very much, but do you think the um, sort of augmentation debate, and have you seen that in your example, that it has an implication for the forms of activism? and labor activism that, that are possible or not possible. Um, do you think that's something that emerges, perhaps in the case of warehouse workers, but also in other, other labor contexts? Um, that's a good question. I think that um, it, it does have implications. Um, and I, and I, but I think the problem, and this goes back to my question, question around conceptual framework, is the assumption in a lot of the literature around warehousing logistics is that the, the, the kind of norm in warehousing is what Burrowo um, used to call despotic workplace regimes, you know, low wage, um, highly authoritarian management structures, um, high labour turnover, not much protection in terms of job security and so on. Um, and that therefore, you know, warehouses are, are um, kind of regarded have long been regarded as these quite difficult places um, for unions to organise. Um, I mean, Amazon is a kind of classic global example, right? A lot of, um, a lot of stories coming out of the US and increasingly in, in Europe as well um, about organising Amazon, Amazon workers. And you know, with fairly limited, um, limited uh, success, more success in Europe in countries like Italy and Germany, um, than, than in, the, in the United States, as it, as it turns out. So I think that the, the shift towards, um, certainly in warehousing, the shift towards you know, kind of human augmentation with technology, at least as far as the literature is concerned, um, is, is making these problems of, of so-called despotism worse, um, which can only make things harder from a, a kind of collective labour organising standpoint. At the same, having said that, there is some very recent research come out. Um, there was some recent research published in Work and Occupation, the journal Work and Occupation, um, and effectively saying that there's greater variety of workplace regimes than scholars have, have, have imagined, and looking particularly at variety across different European countries like Italy, um, Germany, and, and Belgium in this case as well. So it's a good question, but I think the jury's still out. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Tom, I have to say, I, I'm not getting any, I can't see any reactions from, I can't, ah, I can see Roger now. So Roger and then Eduardo, yeah? Okay, off you go. Roger? Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I am from Melbourne originally, and I did my PhD on the introduction of Japanese management in the car industry. And there, there were two big areas of industrial production, one up in Broad, Broadly where you were talking about, and then down, um, you know, along Dandy Nong Road. And um, there was a particular Repco company down in that area 
that had bought a couple of robots. They tried them and they were just stuck over in the corner and they weren't working. And I inquired as to the price of them. They said, oh, they're $1.7 million each. Now, this is back in um, uh, nine, late 80s, right? And so what I figured out is that, like, with, with so they had to buy them. It might be different these days, but they had to buy them. So, and the payback period, they said, was five years at least. Whereas when you've got labour, you actually get two weeks, the company gets two weeks of free labour out of the work or at least a week, and then they pay them. So there wasn't, I, were, I, I, I was sort of arguing and or, so that there wasn't an incentive to automate because of simply the high cost. And the, or not just that, but the, the inefficiency of the robots, that the robot companies were overselling them what they could actually do. Um, and then also, given the, given the nature of the industry, there were these big, or the, the two countries, there would be big debates about what constitutes a robot, because in, a, in, a, in Japan, anything that was automated would be constituted as a robot, whereas uh, in Australia, it had to be, uh, like I forget the name now, but like a, a, it had to be reprogrammable um, and only function, and they had to have one or two, you know, elbows, let's call them. Um, but I was wondering too, if you wouldn't mind um, perhaps um, putting in the chat box some of the, you, I think you said there was a new book out called Class in Australia. I don't know if that was, yeah, that'd be interesting to have a look at. Um, and um, there was something else, but maybe I'll come back to that. Okay, but, uh, Roger, we're getting a little bit short of time. So Mike, yeah, sure. Eduardo, also, could you lower your hand? Do you mind? Yes. <laughs> Eduardo, you can raise your hand now. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, I'm not so familiar with the uh, work, I think you called, is it workplace regimes literature or? Yeah, or labour regimes, sure. Labour regimes, yeah, I, I'm, I'm less familiar with that, but I just want to throw into the equation what you might think about something like um, social constructions of economic value as something that also shapes what uh, companies can and can't get away with. I mean, I live in an area which is the kind of epitome of we buy local and, uh, you know, if the Coles uh, reduces the, the, the number of checkout staffs and expects you to do it yourself, there's a, you know, minor commotions on, you know, our local community chat group. Now, it might be that these people are maybe ordering things through via Amazon or eBay in highly automated ways, but... Um, there is an attachment, I suppose, to local products, the artisanal or the craft like that would probably, I imagine, at some level, um, restrict the extent to which our most successful um, uh, kind of uh, supermarket here is called Foodland. And Foodland doesn't strike you as someone who would be, you know, setting up warehouses of the sort that you're describing. So because it would, it would tarnish their brand. And I think it would tarnish the kind of attachment that local consumers have to local products. So I'm just wondering why does Woolworths get away with it in a way? Yeah, I'm not, it's an interesting question. I'm not, um, I, don't, I don't completely know the, the, the answer to that. I think like a, a, a part of the, the answer to your question and also the answer to, to Roger's um, to Roger's question there to, has to do with the scale of Wilbur, the size of Woolworths as a company and the scale of its operations. So, I mean, if I could go back to, to, to kind of to Roger's point about um, deployment of technology, I think that the, the key lesson here is, is one of economies of scale. I mean, essentially, Woolworths has the capacity to be able to make these kinds of, these kinds of investments, um, which smaller companies are not able to justify. Uh, or, or able to risk. In fact, some of the research coming out of the US, and, and I, in, in my slides, I did, uh, did cite a report which was put together by um, Gitalius and Theodore. Nick Theodore is quite a well-known economic geographer in Chicago, and basically saying that the, the, the extent of automated technologies has been overstated um, in, in the US because most companies do not, because margins are so small, are so squeezed in the logistics supply chain that most companies do not have the profit margins and the economies of scale 
to, to risk investment in robotic technology. So it's very much, it's still nascent technology. And Woolworths can kind of risk it to some extent because of their, because of their size, but it's still a risk. Um, and the kind of the, the extent to which that, that risk will produce kind of negative outcomes for the company is still to be seen, I think. It's still to be determined. But Woolworths is a company that, despite its size, has had a lot of problems in recent years um, in terms of profitability, manage, senior management turnover, um, the failure of its attempt to compete with Bunnings in, um, you know, kind of uh, it, uh, in that in that space. So I think, you know, I I, I think that um, I, I think that will that that's part of the answer is Woolworths is able to justify the risk of, of investing in these technologies. But also, this kind of came up in the in the comment box as well. I mean, yes, they they are they are using just in time delivery so-called lean logistics, which is mm. imported directly from auto manufacturing. Um, and a lot of the technological um, innovations in the industry are, are a direct reflection of manufacturing and particularly car, car manufacturing historically, where which is really still the only industry where robotic technology is still used on a mass scale. So it's still very much nascent in this sector or cutting edge. Okay, I raised my own hand, uh, raised a hand to myself to, uh, to um, th thank you. I, I mean, I've got lots of, thank you, it's really rich stuff. I've got um, very interesting, there are many things that one could say here, but just, just as an aside, um, I, don't, I don't even recall Ro Roger Corbett, who was, who was, who used to run Woolworths for, uh, for many years. Um, as I recall, he became chair of the Fairfax board and is uh, in a famous incident, hurled the Saturday, the weekend papers down on the um, on the board table um, and said that all this digital stuff was rubbish and um, the rivers of gold that funded newspapers would, uh, would, would, would never dry up kind of thing. And uh, so if, I don't know if, if Roger Corbett took that attitude to technology which he, in the media space, if he also exhibited it in the uh, in in the warehousing and uh, and so on space, then I'm, I guess I'm not so surprised from some of the things you had to say. Um, I suppose I've got an old-fashioned sociology question to ask about. I was thinking of Braverman and the degradation of work and all that kind of thing, and I just wondered um, what you know. I mean, I have this. I mean, I've read a lot of horror stories about what goes on in warehousing these days and, you know, the attacks on Amazon and toilet breaks and, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, did, what, did you get any sense, what sense did you get of, was it any, like work satisfaction, commitment to work, self-realisation or actualization through work, um, you know, this kind of work, or, or were they classically alienated workers? Yeah, good question. So certainly talking to the Hume DC work, workforce is that there was, a, there was a, a high degree of satisfaction from the, from the workplace as opposed to the work itself, if you like. I mean, the work itself could be quite, you know, phys, as I said, physically arduous and often backbreaking, but, but there was a, you know, we were talking about a, a, a long-term workforce. I think off the top of my head, like the average employment duration there was um, 11 years. So quite a long, long-term workforce. So not, 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 not a, a, at least among the core permanent workforce and among many of the casuals as well, there was not a, a, a high degree of labor turnover with which we would often associate warehouse logistics. So um, people often found that strongly between their, their kind of personal social networks and, and their workplace. So there was a lot of kind of social, fulfillment in terms of kind of sociality in the mm -hmm. workplace. Which was very, um, very interesting. I think one of the reasons there was a space for them to do that um, was because of, you know, you, a, a strong union on the shop floor um, that created a space where workers weren't berated for talking to each other or uh, th things like that. So, mm -hmm. a, a, absolutely, I think that the, the the presence of a strong union there compl compl um, complicates this picture of work workplace despotism. Um, in terms of Braverman and kind of labor process theory and all that, I mean, obviously that's relevant. It is relevant. Um, but I guess the kind of the stuff which I'm more interested in is the, the labor market aspect. So in terms of 
who are the kinds of, what are the profiles of the sort of workers that companies are looking to hire? Because the kind of traditional image of the warehouse worker is the older, older blue collar male, um, you know, usually in, in kind of in their mid forties, not too different from the average um, manufacturer, kind of a manufacturing worker. Um, and there's, a, there's an extent to which I think companies are looking to try and transcend that by hiring more women, hiring people who have got a, who are tertiary educated, uh, and um, hiring a greater age diversity of workers and so on. Um, whether or not they are succeeding in doing that uh, and in, in succeeding in therefore changing the workplace culture as they call, as they call it, you know, I, I, that's part of the, re, what's one of the research questions which I, I'm trying to address. But that, that's the kind of issue which I'm interested in is um, less the labour process aspect, which is still important, still has to be addressed, but more the labour market aspect in terms of um, what kinds of workers these companies are looking to, to attract and retain. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really, re really fascinating um, stuff. And uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of not surprised that, you know, because there's lots of, lots of research about you know people can have what what from the outside look like really miserable jobs but they actually get mm. quite a lot of satisfaction if not from the job but from from their work relationships and, and, and also sense of status so we've got some um, uh, six minutes left so uh roger do you want to come back in yeah i want to come back in as the digital productions uh, di digital publications editor for Taza. So, Tom, first of all, if you can remember to stop the recording afterwards, um, and then you'll have to put it up onto, um, I'm not sure where you'll put it up. You might have to get in touch with Sally, or if you've got Dropbox, put it up there and send me a link. Yep, and then awesome. secondly, for both yourself and David, I know you've sent, you sent me the link for the class in Australia book, but David, if you've got a forthcoming book and you wanted to publicise it, if you could send me the links um, to the um addresses digital pe at tar it's in the uh, chat oh, right. yeah and the same with you tom if you want to send the links to the say the awu um website where that report was um that'll be that'll be great so i'll take so, my yeah, yeah. sorry to say mine's just a chapter in a book which is forthcoming it's been forthcoming for a very long time <laughs> uh, but um uh, I can certainly send you a, a link to. I think it's due out, you know, soon. So happy to do that. Thanks, Thanks for asking. Okay. And I just sent, I just send a link to. Uh, so I, I misunderstood you at first. So I just sent you a link to uh, the uh, Braverman classic labour and monopoly capital: the degradation of work in the twentieth well, century. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, now we go to the twenty-first, I guess. So. Yeah. Um, so we've got four minutes. Uh, Tom, maybe I should go back to you now because you're running this. Uh, you're really running. Sure, sure. sure. Um, no, I've just, I've, I've, thanks, Dave. Thank you very much for doing that, David. So I've just, I've just posted the link. I, I did it once and it failed. I've, I've done it a second time, a PDF there, which is the United Workers Report, which you can access. If you, you just stick that into, into Google, it'll, it'll come up. Um, so that, that's there. But yeah, look, did anyone have any final questions or comments before we, before we wrap things up? Because I think we are almost out of time. I do, but I, I think we should probably go the um, presidential um, address close is on in a couple of minutes. So okay. um, yeah, I Agreed. think we should probably go. Okay, well, was, it was well, a pleasure, well. both of the papers. Yeah. Uh, we ran out of time, even though we only had two papers. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, thank you for giving that, for your tolerance, everyone, giving us the space, you know, which I, I actually, in the end, I thought worked, worked really well. Thank, thanks to Tom in particular for setting it up. And yeah. uh, I mean, there were differences, clear differences between them, but, uh, you know, the whole the kind of actual principle around labour and, and, yeah. and work and, and technology, well, indeed, technology, mine was media, your, uh, yours is uh, automation. I mean, lots going on there. So, so th thanks a lot, everyone, for, thank uh, you. for coming. No and, uh, thank you. Look, thank you, everyone. And uh, looking forward to meeting you again sometime. Thank you. Yeah, great. See you. See you all later. Yeah, see you at, <laughs> at, at, uh, at Althea's farewell yeah. speech in a minute. Yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. -bye now. bye.